Doordarshan, India's public service broadcaster, presents stories and documentaries from Goa, celebrating legends and legacies from India's beautiful state, where East meets the West, with art and culture at its best. When was the last time you doubled up with laughter? It might well have been when you chanced upon a Mario. The popular artist has long departed from this world, but his works are all over the map. The world was indeed his canvas. From his family home in the sleepy little Goan village of Luthali, he ambled into the most exuberant art capitals, and they happily played host to the one and only Mario de Miranda. Although India remembers him as a cartoonist, Mario was a versatile artist of international repute. Here we present glimpses of his childhood in Goa, his hectic professional life in Mumbai and travels abroad, and the eventful last phase of his life in his ancestral village. Mario was consumed by wanderlust, but always returned to Muse Goa for a breather, and finally came to rest in her bosom. This heartwarming artist uniquely presented brand Goa to the world and drew the world to Goa. Born in 1926 to a Catholic family of the landed gentry, he was baptized Mario Carlos do Rosario de Brito Miranda. But most people knew him as Mario Miranda or simply as Mario for this is how he signed his works. His father, Constancio do Rosario Miranda, was a taluka administrator in Daman, then a Portuguese enclave on the coast of Gujarat. He married Maria Zulema de Brito, an artistically gifted homemaker. They had three children, Pedro, Mario and Fatima. Mario spent his initial years on the Miranda estate in South Goa. He lived with his parents and grandparents in their manor house that flaunted a coat of arms granted by the Portuguese in the 19th century. Mario wore his heritage lightly, yet took delight in the old world atmosphere marked by wit and humor, music and mirth. In an ambience steeped in culture, Mario was attracted to reading, football and the piano. Most of all, he took to sketching even before he learned to read and write. So if he wasn't playing gramophone records to soothe his musical ear, he would be doodling Goan celebrities, village bumpkins and pets on the house walls. Well, as far as I can remember, I started when I was very young. I think it must have been, uh, I must have been around five or six years old. Because I still have uh, little pieces of paper and sketchbooks. And uh, that shows that I must, uh, I must have been around five years old or six years old when I started. And uh, even when I used to read the school books, I used to sketch in the margin and imaginary things. And the school teachers, friends. These are all from my uh, early childhood. But then later my mother used to give me in sort of blank sketchbooks and encouraged me to keep a diary and so I used to sketch almost every day, events of the day. Recognizing her son's talent and urge to sketch, Maria Zulema handed him blank diaries and from then on, notebooks and pencils became his coveted Christmas gifts. Mario feverishly drew whatever struck him as funny, bright, breezy colour sketches with a few jottings in Portuguese. I can't say much about him as a child because uh, there's a 16 year gap in age. The time that I was with him, he, he, he spent a lot of time uh, reading, 
listening to music and of course sketching. That was his hobby, I think. And uh, I used to sit around him whilst he was sketching and it didn't bother him. And I used to play with his hair and <laughs> make plaits, <laughs> but he never uh, complained. He used to go out with his friends in the village and then come home and draw whatever happened. He would make, uh, you know, a cartoon or whatever happened in the village. And always with humor, he used to put, you know, highlight the humorous part of whatever happened. <laughs> so that was, you know, and he was well known in the village as a cartoonist. So many people used to criticize, you know, that he used to draw them in a peculiar, you know, way to highlight the humorous part of it. He was a shy little genius, sharp-eyed and fun-loving. His gestural drawings were virtually his confessions, which froze a microcosm of mid-20th century Goa. Goan characters so peopled his work that one could correctly say, here is Goa's plenty. See, the diaries are probably his starting point of his uh, career as a cartoonist. He was asked by his mother, forced by his mother, to do these drawings every day. So in the process of doing the diaries, he developed a very fine sense of art and humor. And the diaries are probably the best record of Goa during this period, which is 1948, 1949, 1950, 1951. And also it's the best view one gets of Mario's way of thinking. He was a social commentator, particularly about Goa, you know. Maybe without, uh, you know, Mario's cartoons, to, to picture Goa is, is, is always incomplete. Because you look at Mario's cartoons about Goa, then you know that, yes, this is Goa. You know, in, in, in a way that nobody else did. There was an essential strain in Mario Miranda and his work and his art, uh, his goneness, his goneness. The way he soaked up Goa, its ways, its culture, like a blotter takes up water. When you look at Mario Sir's works, you look at Goa differently. I think that's the beauty of uh, Mario Sir's art. It's not just about uh, he sketching and uh, he painting, but uh, how he uh, adds emotions to the art and how those emotions pass on through the expressions of his artworks to the audience, to the viewer. To Mario, life was nothing but art. On closer inspection, his chronicles transcend Goa, they mirror universal human nature and point to a caricaturist in the making. Mario, who might well have been one of the world's youngest visual diarists, comes across as a rough and ready social anthropologist to boot. He notices everything and everyone and spares none, be it an incident at the marketplace, a wedding or a religious procession. By his natural ability to see through people, the serious and pompous very specially came under his scanner. Then, a lively tableau wends its way through the artist's mind, speaking volumes of his mental grasp. So, more than just Goa's plenty, one could say of Mario what Dryden said of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, Here is God's plenty. Mario's logbook is very much a portrait of the young man as an artist, but just how did his contemporaries view this feisty lad? See, Mario is, uh, has a number of facets to him. One is, he's very funny. The second thing is, he bears no malice. He's always looking at the funny side of things. You see, a lot of cartoonists have political or they have a certain ideology. Mario is looking at the funny things. And um, he captures the spirit of a place, 
Like he's captured the spirit of Bombay very well. He's captured the spirit of Goa. If he's taken to Germany, he captures the spirit of Germany. So he's, that's what makes him very popular. Well, you see, Mario was, as you well know, as everybody knows, was a uh, wonderful social cartoonist. You know, he was a wonderful cartoonist of social manners and so on and so forth. Because when he was a cartoonist for the Times of India group, there were three famous cartoonists of the country. One was, of course, Shankar, who used to be in Delhi. And then there was R.K. Lakshman. R.K. Lakshman and Mario Miranda were the two cartoonists who used to work with Times of India group. Uh, but uh, the, among the two, Lakshman, of course, was a political cartoonist, essentially, while Mario was a kind of social cartoonist about social mores. You know, he, he looked at the funny side of things and also kind of made the social kind of commentary with whatever he made. You know, he had some sp characters that he had created and uh, you had these kind of uh, little uh, cartoons that used to appear both in Illustrate Weekly and Times of India, along with R.K. Lakshman's cartoons as well. The Miranda couple gave their children an English medium education. The boys studied at St. Joseph's, Bengaluru, where buddies lapped up Mario's naughty pencil strokes. To groom him for the Parisian he called the Boza, his mother enrolled Mario first at Mumbai's JJ School of Art in 1943. But alas, Mario felt trapped rather than freed by formal art education. He left art school in a day and joined St. Xavier's College instead. He graduated in English literature and briefly considered joining the Indian Administrative Services. Much later, he declared that he was better off as a cartoonist than he would ever have been as a bureaucrat. Diary keeping had long become second nature to Mario. He had a hunch it would take him places. But by the time he was out of college, the world had changed greatly. It was the aftermath of the Second World War. Indian independence was round the corner and the political future of Goa, then a Portuguese colony, was shaky. Add to this the fact that his father had died and Mario saw a question mark hanging over his future. Until 1951, it was a fluid situation. Mario had dilly-dallied a little before coming to the conclusion that Mumbai was his best bet. No doubt, the city had a promising cultural ambience, but here he was, jobless. Taking life in his stride, Mario partied, watched movies back-to-back -back, and attended church on Sundays. He wasn't in a hurry. He had the art in him. He only had to capitalize on it. Well, I, went, I came to Bombay with the intention of doing my IAS, so that I could join the civil service. So I joined St. Xavier's College and, uh, to do my BA. But uh, fortunately, I brought my diaries along and I wanted to make some extra pocket money. So I went around with these diaries and uh, showed it to some of the editors. And one of the editors was D.F. Karaka of Courage magazine. He liked my work very much and um, he said, why don't I draw for, for current? Which I started doing. And uh, I must say he was a great help and encouragement. I learned a lot through him. He was a very tough editor. And whenever he didn't like any of my drawings, he used to just throw them in the waste paper basket. But if he did like them, he used to give me some extra money. So the, that kept me going. I made uh, quite a bit of pocket money and gradually I was then I was offered a job in the Times and so I gave up the idea of uh, doing the IAS and stuck to cartooning. One day however Mario was devoured by self-doubt. Would he ever make a living from his art? At their lodgings at Rockville, Polycar Povage, a fellow Goan whom they called Polly, became his rock of salvation. Polly suggested that Mario handcraft picture postcards depicting Mumbai's monuments. He even graciously offered to sell them. And sell them he did, at the hotel where he worked the night shift. Needless to say, Mario and Polly became lifelong friends. Mario stayed in Bombay for some time without any work. But he had a very good friend 
who he who was staying with him. I think Polycarp was was his best friend, and uh, Polycarp would appreciate the drawings that Mario did, and he would take them out and show them to his friends and sell them. So th that was the way that Mario first had his income. Then he joined the Times of India, and there was no looking back from that. Mario kept refining his craft while also making the rounds of the newspaper offices. His precious diaries comprised his portfolio of work and suddenly his mother's bright idea began to look like a passport to an exciting future. Mario received job offers in quick succession. Editor D.F. Karaka of The Current got him to cover a can-can dance scene held at the Taj. Mario's saucy cartoon was such a ripticler that the editor took him on as the paper's regular cartoonist. And it wasn't long before the high quality stuff that the 25 year old was turning out every week caught the eye of another editor, C. R. Mandy of the Illustrated Weekly of India. He forthwith invited Mario to join the prestigious magazine. But at that time in the Times, uh, I was lucky enough to have very good uh, art directors. Professor Langhammer, and the editor was Yar Mendy, an Irishman, and they they were a great help for me to develop my even my sense of humor. They were very strict as far as my drawings are concerned. Strict about your sense of humor. They're strict about my sense of humor because they do sometimes they used to say this is rubbish absolutely, and and, and as Karaka used to do, they used to just throw it in the waste paper basket. But when they liked something, they really praised you and they laughed. So you, you felt that you were being uh, watched very closely. So that kind of a reaction was nice. They were not indifferent to what I did. Funny stuff doesn't necessarily come from a funny man. Mario had a serious face and took cartooning to be serious business. Not the least because lampooning political figures involves high risk or so he learned early on, tired as he was of overreacting bigwigs. Not that Mario beat a hasty retreat Rather, he kept his school and ran his race, but eventually he turned a little demure, but remained razor sharp and telling. He looked at life and people and how they lived. He liked to see the funny side of everything. But at the same time, he understood the difficulties that people underwent, especially in crowded places like Bombay Flats and uh, trains and the way they had to manage their lives. I think he was in full sympathy with that because he portrayed all that in his cartoons very well. Although he saw himself as a social cartoonist at best, really speaking, everything was grist to his creative eye. The bureaucracy, fashions, business, people's habits, music, society and even politics. Nothing that was human was alien to him. A lot of Madhu Miranda's work was meant to entertain, but a lot of it uh, was meant to provoke thought. But all of it bedecked in his unique style. Uh, in Cyrano de Bergerac's final words, his flourish, his panache. You know, Mario Miranda is called a cartoonist illustrator. Uh, I think there are gatekeepers of high art who gave him that title. In my opinion, Mario Miranda is a great artist, period. You can't sort of compartmentalize him into a cartoonist or an illustrator. Had Mario finally found his voice? How far was he fulfilling his mission as an artist? The fact is that from the word go, Mario had thrown himself headlong into his profession. The burnout was high. Hence the year 1959 felt like a breath of fresh air as he dashed off to Portugal in a first ever trip abroad. This time around he had published works in addition to his diaries. It was an impressive collection that promptly got him a year-long grant from Lisbon's Kalushte Gulbenkian Foundation. Mario lost no time in getting to know the charming country and its people, sampling their food, wines and the emblematic fado. He happily distilled the essence of the Portuguese soul into his sketches.
Well, after I joined the Times, I got a, this urge to, to travel a bit. So I saved some money and uh, got into a flight, enough money to buy a ticket. Got into a ticket, uh, flight, and went off to, to Lisbon, actually. And in Lisbon, uh, whatever work I had done here was very much appreciated, and the Gulbenkian Foundation gave me a scholarship which was quite a lot of money, and, and I spent about a year in, in Lisbon, wasted most of that money, going to cabarets and... Uh, but I learned a lot. I learned a lot in life, I must say. That one year was not wasted entirely. Mario followed up his stay in Lisbon with a trip to London, where he met cartoonists Ronald Giles, Raymond Jackson, Jack, Victor Ways, Vicky, and bumped into his all-time favorite, Ronald Searle, at a pub on Fleet Street. Mario was content to do cartoons for the classic humor magazine Lilliput and for ITV, but featuring in Punch, the flag bearer of humor magazines at the time, was really the icing on the cake. Punch had helped coin the term cartoon in its modern sense as a humorous illustration. It regularly featured India and was a huge source of knowledge about the subcontinent for British readers. In England, I had the opportunity to exchange views with the other cartoonists. You know, they used to meet very often. Something which unfortunately does not happen very often in, in India. Mario stayed in London longer than expected. He regarded it as a turning point in his career for more reasons than one. He had earned good money and made many friends. But most importantly, Searle's words, far from unsettling him, had given him the confidence to go it alone. Meanwhile, on learning that Goa had changed hands, Mario's heart went out to his home in Luthali. But then, Bombay's lights beckoned. When he sought re-employment, the Times group of publications received him with open arms. In Bombay, art enthusiast and air hostess, Habiba Haidari swept him off his feet. 24-year-old Habiba was the daughter of Iqbal Haidari and Rohaina Mohabdi. Her father was a senior executive of the Indian Railways and belonged to the nobility of the erstwhile princely state of Hyderabad. Mario and Habiba married on the 10th of November 1963 and had two children, Raul and Rishad, who presently live in the Luthalim home. The following year, he published Goa with Love, dedicating it to Habiba. They were like lumber, you know? My mom was the boss, for sure. Uh -huh. But they, they were friends more than I did. Mario reached new heights in the 1970s and 80s. His work was everywhere, in school textbooks, corporate calendars and trendy magazines. Successive editors of the weekly, Kushwan Singh, M.V. Kamath and British Nandi held Mario in high esteem, while humorist Behram contractor, Elias Bisbee and political commentator Vinod Mehta were among his closest associates. In a way, while journalist colleagues were busy writing reams of prose, Mario deftly read between the lines and came up with delightful visuals. That was over and above his pocket cartoons that were all the rage. The archetypal secretary Ms. Fonseca, the boss and his hapless minion Godwole, the fat corrupt politician Bandaldas, and his sidekick Moon Swami, not forgetting the bosomy Bollywood star Rajni Nimbupani. Millions across generations grew up on those cartoon characters that are now etched in the collective memory. There was a secretary uh, and a, a boss uh, series of cartoons which he did. And in that cartoon, there's one cartoon where is a young man who has come for an interview with a boss. And uh, the young man is telling the interviewer that I worked for a bogus company and I was sacked for honesty. He had this way of looking at the world you know, in, in a kind of humorous as well as kind of nostalgic and sometimes sad way, you know. So he, he was essentially a social commentator about urban life. And later on, of course, he had also about Goan life itself. Mario's hand would not have been what it became if his mind was not what it always was, an artist's mind. This is something transformative, enriching in a new dimension. 
1972 was a hugely fascinating year for Mario. The United States Information Service flew him to America and Tel Aviv invited him to stop en route. So Mario shook hands with prominent Israeli cartoonists even before he had met with his US counterparts like Charles Schulz, creator of Peanuts, Herb Locke, editorial cartoonist of the Washington Post, Pat Oliphant of the Denver Post, and Ed Fisher of the New Yorker. Mad Magazine featured Mario, who then, writing in the weekly, described that enormous world in a piece titled, Cartoons, American Style. For a long time, Mario was one of the six or seven cartoonists that ruled the roost in India. However, long years of editorial art had left him with little leisure to pursue what he liked best, sketching. Unlike his diaries, cartooning had curbed his spontaneity, compelling him to tone down the humor and play to the readership. At the end of a quarter of a century's absence from his home state, Mario published a second edition of Goa with Love, an evocative book of caricatures on Goan life. It was as much a celebration of the fast-fading world of his childhood as it was a nostalgic tribute to the line art that had grown on him. I don't think there's a single book that I don't have of Mario. What stands out of his work about Goa is his illustration. You take the book Goa with Love. They are all illustration, but after laced with humor. There's a lot of humor in his illustration. That's what makes uh, Mario Miranda unique. Mario had always loved to watch crowds, not be a part of them. In the bustle of Mumbai, he began to value moments away from the madding crowd. He would take long walks or quietly slip into the anonymity of a movie theatre. And while he got less and less interested in cartooning, he felt more and more excited about capturing moods and ambiances for his pictorial travelogues. In 1978, Germany was his second major all-paid trip abroad in the course of his second innings with the Times Group. In 1979, he left that influential media group to join the newly established tabloid Midday under contractor's editorship. Six years later, he followed contractor who had founded the Afternoon Dispatch and Courier. Mario's cartoons went well with Bisbee's kind of humor. He was happy to stick to his friend, but was by and large weary of the rough and tumble of editorial cartooning. No wonder Mario had reserved the freedom to freelance and travel at will. This change of course was a master stroke. It brought to the fore the sublime artistry of Mario's pencil, pen and brush. Those early expressive continuous line drawings that he once dabbled in had become quite stylized as he went through life professionally. His art later transmuted into neat black ink pen illustrations. They sported straight graphite lines with flat cross hatching for tonal variations, very typical of his pictorial travelogues. Then in a span of three decades, Mario had held over 30 solo exhibitions across the country and the world, covering cities like Paris, New York, Lisbon, East Berlin, Singapore, Macau and Madrid. Spotting themes in his destination countries was central to his art. They grew into finely detailed and nuanced sketches of his travel series that were unmistakably Mario. I've done America, uh, then I did Germany, then of course I did sketches of Yugoslavia, Sweden, Austria and um, but my latest thing is on on Paris actually just the city of Paris which I think is one of the most beautiful cities in the world and for somebody who wants to to sketch or to draw or to paint I think uh, Paris is, provides all the, the atmosphere the material and I think that's the reason why the Paris produced the impressionists I think and most of them lived in Paris in that period Historically, it's, there's so much of history in Paris and visually it is so beautiful. The boulevards, the cafe life. The cafes themselves, uh, you could sit, sit for hours just looking at the, at the type of people, you know, coming in and out of the cafes. And there's so much, um, so much about the cafes. I mean, there's people like uh, Hemingway and James Joyce and all these to frequent these cafes, Marlowe, 
And today tourists come to these cafes because these people used to be there and it's become tourist attractions. But they're very friendly places also. The waiters never ask you to leave. You can sit around for hours with a cup of coffee. It's one of the cheapest places to spend some time in, I think. I think Mario Miranda's uh, greatest work is his drawings of his visit to Germany, to France. Those drawings are absolutely world-class and could be considered great art by any standards of great art. His illustrations inspired governments of uh, France, America, uh, Switzerland, England, Australia. All these embassies, they specially invited Mario to their countries to capture their lifestyle. By the end of the 1980s, Mario was already a household name in India, a legend in his lifetime. But rather than simply coast along, he reinvented himself as an illustrator and muralist. Karnataka commissioned Mario to illustrate a book by Dom Marais. Goa assigned him Manohar Mulgaonkar's Inside Goa. And J.R.D. Tata engaged him for a book on his business family to name just a few titles. Besides, Mario famously designed some of his characters for Air India and did murals for hotels and institutions in Goa and Mumbai. Kala Academy, designed by Charles Correa in the 80s, sports Mario's cardboard cutout figures in the auditorium. The modern municipal market complex and the Krishnadas Shama Central Library in Goa's capital city, Panaji, proudly exhibit Mario's labor of love. The genial artist similarly obliged friends and acquaintances. In a way, working on Inside Goa marked the beginning of Mario's homeward journey. Around the same time, Mario, the movie enthusiast of yesteryear, happily acted as creative assistant for Sea Wolves, a war film shot in Goa. and film director Sham Benegal, struck by Mario's heritage house in Nutoli, launched Trikal, loosely based on the Miranda family. Dona Maria ke pati. When I wanted to make this film, he said to me, um, Mario said, see, since I'm from Goa, if you wish to shoot your film, why don't you look at my house, you know? So I said, uh, you, you, you have a big house there? He said, yes, I have an enormous house. Enormous, large, big house. And it's a very old house. And uh, so I went to Goa. So I worked out a story based on a house which has seen different people come and go. And so that house I chose was Mario Miranda's house. And I decided to go and shoot this film there. And uh, everything was perfect because the whole, whole uh, little village of Lutoli itself was like a ready-made set for me to make this film. And so because I used the church, I used the church of Lotuli, and then I used the, you know, the, the, the graveyard there, and also the house in which Mario himself lived. And I'd asked Mario permission if I could go and shoot there. He said, fine, go ahead and shoot. But of course, it was in a state of some disrepair, so we had to kind of uh, restore the house as well in order to be able to shoot the film there, which we did, and we enjoyed the experience enormously. Goa based projects had obviously come in handy. Habiba, in particular, was keen to refurbish the family home, which soon began to feature in coffee table books and glossy magazines. Finally, as age caught up with them, their homing instinct came to the fore. In 1996, the couple gave up their rented apartment at Kalaba's Navy Nagar and returned with pets to the same sleepy little village of Lutoli, which was frozen in time almost just as Mario had left it half a century earlier.
However, none of that brought Mario's long love story with Mumbai to an end. The inveterate caricaturist kept infusing the country with his daily dose of humor through the mega city's newspapers. He was a workaholic. Yeah, workaholic. It's, Never left the cartoon table. strips were regular, no? for economic terms, whatever. But the exhibitions, he would switch from one painting to another, go back, and that's why he was perfect. And he loved drawing. Closer home, Mario and Habiba stepped up their social and cultural participation. Mario was that quintessential Goan, brimming with dreams to fulfill and promises to keep. He is a gentleman of the first class. He, very softly spoken and very friendly. Never, I don't think he ever had any person who was an enemy of his. Mario was a classy person. Of course, you can see through his drawings, but as a human being, as a person, he was classy. He loved good music. He loved good food. But I remember in his house, till he died, okay, all his food was cooked on firewood in traditional utensils. Okay, that much, you know, Mario loved Goa. Even the way the kitchen was done up, Okay, was done like a proper Goan kitchen with every element. That was Mario. He was a man of good taste. Okay, with everything that he did, everything, right? Even the Feni, one of the few guys. Okay, I've seen who loved his Feni. You know, everything was about Goa. Life had come full circle for the renowned artist. As convener of Intact Goa. Mario sought help from the Gulbenkian Foundation to set up a Christian art museum at Rushall Seminary. The museum has since moved to Old Goa's Santa Monica Convent, which is more directly on the tourist and pilgrim path. Mario also secured funding from the Lady Hamlin Trust London for the restoration of Goa's iconic Rej Magosh Fort. Mario's passion for Goa's unique culture was obvious, and he went about it without fanfare. He inspired fashion designer Wendell Rodriguez to document the Goan dress through the Mother Goa project. He was also instrumental in getting artist Victor Hugo Gomes to study Goa's ethnography, an experiment that led to the setting up of the Goa Chitra Museum. If it wasn't for Mario Miranda, I wouldn't have been in Goa. Okay, when I was a national awardee based in Lucknow, Mario Miranda was the convener of Intech and he wanted to set up a Christian art museum, that was his dream. Okay, and of course I didn't know him that time, personally. So he approached uh, O.P. Agarwal, who was the head of Intech in Lucknow, where I had done a course in uh, conservation. So O.P. Agarwal mentioned to Mario that there's a Goan boy, okay, a bright Goan boy in Lucknow. That's how Mario brought me down to Goa to set up the Christian art museum. And from that day, the day I reached Goa, Okay, till his death, Mario and me, we were very, very close. He's the guy who actually mentored me in many ways how to look at things. It is, besides my grandmother, okay, the other person who made me fall in love with Goa is Mario Miranda. Mario was a testimony to my work, especially as a collector with the work that I've done. I think Mario was one of the first guys who came here much before Goa Chitra was thrown open. Mario has seen my collection raw, you know, because we used to have parties and it was always with Mario. We always invited Mario. Okay, and he was a guy who used to admire, you know, all this collection used to be part of my house earlier, you know, but I never had an idea of setting up a museum. So, yeah, it was Mario everywhere. Right through my journey, it was Mario. Quite ironically, he who made light of just any situation found little reason to smile when it came to Goa's heritage and environment. To Mario's credit, he never allowed his natural optimism to flag. He who had never worked for money and fame came to be recognized in myriad ways. He was conferred the Padma Shri in 1988 and the Padma Bhushan in 2002. Five years later, he received the Goa State Cultural Award. In 2009, King Juan Carlos bestowed on him the cross of the Order of Isabel the Catholic, Spain's highest civilian honor, and Portugal knighted him as commander of the Order of Prince Henry. Mario Miranda was a great man and a great artist. 
a sua obra gráfica uh, é de uma excepcional importância cultural, porque reflete muito da vida e dos cotidianos de Goa. Ele apreciava uh, a vida social, o património, e reproduziu com a sua arte, o seu humor inteligente e a sua criatividade artística. Mário Miranda era também um homem cosmopolita e um viajante e apresentou a sua obra em diversos países desde Macau, aos Estados Unidos, ao Brasil e em vários países da Europa. Eu próprio tive a oportunidade de acompanhar a exposição que ele apresentou na Sociedade Nacional de Belas Artes em Lisboa, no ano 2001, que foi patrocinada pelo Presidente da Índia e que foi um momento alto da apresentação da cultura goesa em Portugal. Um grande sucesso. Mário Miranda era um amigo e era um dos muitos amigos que eu tinha em Goa que me fazem sentir em Goa como fosse a minha própria terra. Mário Miranda deixou obra notável e hoje é uma saudade que eu tenho naquela terra. At the fag end of an illustrious career, Mario's inability to get back to his watercolors and the piano were his only regrets. He aged considerably in the last two years of his life, but was still his shy and witty self to the end, until the night when he died in his sleep. It was the 11th of December, 2011. India grieved as someone who personified the country's treasure was cremated the next day and his ashes strewn over the Zuari at Rushall. The amazing Goan artist was posthumously awarded the Padma Vibhushan, India's second highest civilian award. A road junction was named after him in Mumbai. What is the legacy Mario leaves behind? You know, a lot of people have written about Goa in words but without any evidence, whereas Mario has left a pictorial evidence of what Goa was, you know, through the ages. If, on the one hand, his caricatures seem as relevant and amusing today as when they first appeared on Newsprint, on the other, with a change in generational sensibilities, Will Mario's cartoons pass muster as regards sexist stereotypes? Some of the characters that he created, uh, for instance, if you look at uh, the Miss Nimupani, uh, the, the Bollywood starlet in his cartoons, or uh, Miss Fonseca, who, uh, who appeared in the pages of uh, the, the Economic Times, and, and the early readers at that point of time felt she was too buxom and she needed to be, uh, uh, she was over sexy, and then uh, the editors also told him, but he said, look, this, this is the way, way I draw. And then there were, there were attempts to change her dress from the polka dotted dress to something more, more demure, but that, that also did, did happen. So, so everybody, I mean, if you look at Miss Fonseca, Mrs. Uh, uh, Miss Nimupani, if you look at uh, uh, Bandal Das, the, 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 the Joe who happened to be in those, in those offices, the uh, so soft-spoken, uh, very lost character who was, who was so delightful. Mario's humor was gentle, humane. Thanks to his authentic nature, he is sure to live into the next generation. I think my students, myself, are always going to treasure Mario Sir's works and I hope to pass on his uh, um, art, his creations, his uh, humor and uh, his creativity to my students and to the future generations to come in Goa as well as all India. Typically, Saudad is an emotive word by which the artist conveyed the Goan ethos. Saudad, or nostalgia, is just what the Arm Army feels for him who daily captured their joys and sorrows with compassion and irony. They can't thank him enough for that dose of laughter and psychological relief. If we have to talk about his legacy, uh, I think of course his legacy is not obviously restricted to Goa. He is a, he's a huge international figure and I don't think India has recognized him and paid paid tribute to him or his excellence in the manner that it that it should. Even Goa doesn't, I mean Goa of course, uh, Goans like him, love him, there, there, there are attempts to keep his legacy on. But I don't think uh, we've done enough to actually recognize the greatness of Mario de Miranda. Mario has left an indelible stamp on our country's consciousness and enjoys an international appeal. A man of few words, his creations spoke for him. 
they had a special quality, unmatched and inimitable, while he was serious. His creations were funny, seriously funny. India's public service broadcaster presents stories and documentaries from Goa celebrating legends and legacies from India's beautiful state where East meets the West with art and culture at its best.